Hello and welcome to the National Secular Society podcast. I'm Asa Lichten, Head of Education at the NSS. Today's episode is part nine in a 10 part series of interviews where I speak with activists and experts about religious freedom and what it means to them. What does religious freedom truly mean? While some religious lobbyists use the term to demand privilege, this series will serve to highlight that true religious freedom means freedom of belief for peoples of all religion and none. This is leading up to our major conference, Secularism 2019. If this conversation has whet your appetite, then I hope you'll join us at the Tower Hotel in London on the 18th of May. Details are at the end of the show and in the show notes. Today I spoke with Simon Barrow. Simon is Director of Ecclesia, a non-profit think tank focusing on the changing role of beliefs, values and faith and non-faith belief in public life. Simon has a background as a commentator, journalist and lecturer and theologian as well as various NGO roles. So without further ado, let's get to the interview. Enjoy. Simon, welcome to the National Secular Society podcast. Thank you very much indeed. Delighted to be with you. Happy to have you here. I thought perhaps you could start by introducing yourself to the audience, just telling them who you are and what you do. Okay. Well, um, I'm Simon Barrow, as you've already said, and um, I'm based in Edinburgh in Scotland, and I'm the director of Ecclesia, which is uh, a think tank that looks at the relationship between beliefs and ethics on the one hand, and then politics, economics, environment, and so on on the other hand. And we we have quite a long track record of dealing with these issues of, of religious freedom and the role of religion in public life. And I guess the orientation we have is is what you would describe at the as at the dissenting end of, of Christianity, the the progressive end of Christianity, arguing against uh, overbearing religious privilege. Um, and arguing very much in favour of a conversational approach between people of different convictions and also collaboration wherever possible. So I'm delighted that we have been on the same side as the National Secular Society on a number of issues and the um, Humanist UK as, as well and so on. And we've also drawn into conversation about these big public issues, people of all religious traditions and none. So that's very much part of um, my personal commitment as well. And so I, as I say, I'm director of Ecclesia. I've been working with Ecclesia since 2003, really. Um, And before that, I was actually Assistant General Secretary of Churches together in Britain and Ireland and have a background both in public affairs journalism, but also in in working for the the churches. So these days, I, I apart from directing a think tank I do sort of commentary and journalism and bits of um, uh, teaching at university level as well it's what my wife describes as my way of earning a lack of income very good Um, so what does religious freedom mean to you personally uh, it means a lot to me personally, though, um, forgive me, I'm, I'm a policy wonk, I'm immediately going to kind of want to redefine the term a little bit. I, I tend to refer to freedom of religion or belief, um, first of all, to stress that what I'm concerned about is not just people of my own uh, beliefs and convictions, but people of all other beliefs and convictions who might find their freedom of expression or their freedom of action threatened by others. And so I regard uh, my freedom of of thought and action as interrelated to uh, other people's uh, freedom of thought of action. And and indeed, I I think I'm a little bit nervous about talking of um, freedom of religion, because we're not talking about the freedom to hold or dispute ideas, we're talking about people. In a sense, it's freedom of believers, whether those are religious or non-religious believers. And it means a lot to me personally, because for example, I I have friends, um, Christians and humanists and others in the Middle East and other parts of the world who've had direct experience um, of imprisonment and harassment, uh, threats of death and so on. So this is a very personal issue and it's something that we you know, have to find ways of working together on across our other differences um, in order to begin to create a world where actually um, we do not need to threaten and harass and imprison and torture and kill those who are different uh, to, to ourselves. That's absolutely fundamental. Mm. I, I guess one of the things that bring, brings up is if we look around the world, uh, Christians are the group, the, the, the 
if you look at uh, abuses of freedom of religion and belief, Christians yeah. are by and large the, the largest group suffering those. Yeah, and I mean we look at quite her- horrific stuff. You know, we see churches being bulldozed in China. You see, you know, house churches being raised in Saudi Arabia, and the, there are often some Christians in the UK sort of uh, talk about the persecution of Christians and then they also right. lump in uh, and also uh, this uh, this Christian had to serve a gay person in their shop yeah, in the UK. Absolutely. Well, it, indeed. And, and let me say to start off with that I think attempts to suggest that Christians are persecuted in the UK is simply uh, a, an abuse of language. It's extremely insulting to Christians and other people who really are threatened and persecuted throughout the world. And it's an ideological attempt to advance a particular narrow form of religion by using that kind of language. Uh, now, as a, as a matter of fact, um, uh, a couple of years ago, Ecclesia published a very uh, interesting book called The Jesus Candidate, um, Political Religion in a Secular Age by Paul Lusk, who comes from an evangelical Christian background, as well as having very wide experience in public affairs. And one of the things that Paul does in that book is to go into detail uh, regarding the kind of cases that uh, some well-known um, Christian lobby groups in Britain have been using to suggest that there is persecution. And he dismantles those really rather effectively from a legal point of view, but also from a, a, a Christian point of view, because what this is really about is an attempt to uh, institute a, a, a kind of religious privilege and to use the language of religious freedom in order to disguise that. And I think, you know, I find that uh, something that that's insulting, as I say, to those who genuinely are persecuted, and something that we all need to uh, expose and combat. And along with that, of course, more recently has become the attempt to introduce the term Christophobia. Um, uh, and uh, so, again, that's a, 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 another attempt to, to turn into ideology a, a, a particular viewpoint that's trying to assert itself um, from a position of dominance, which is, is what it really seeks, I think. I mean, that also relates to, to the sort of changing place of, of different forms of Christianity and different forms of religion in um, society in Britain and more widely in the West, which we might go on and, and have a look about, a look at as a, a sort of contributory factor here. Mm. How much uh, is Ecclesia's focus or, or work divided between sort of those international freedom of belief issues and more domestic concerns? Well, uh, freedom of belief is, I suppose, something that cuts across a number of, of other issues. As a matter of fact, probably the, the majority of our work in recent years has been on public policy issues to do with poverty, working with disabled people on disability issues and, and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, in, in our earlier years, we worked quite heavily on those questions of religion and public life, and we've perhaps done less of that more, more recently. Um, so amongst other things, it's good to be brought back to that and to have this opportunity to have a, a conversation with the NSS and its partners a, about that because I think it's very much coming back into the arena and something that we need some fresh ways of tackling. But the one thing that I would say about uh, Ecclesia in terms of the work that we've done over the years is that a common thread has been uh, a critique of what we would call Christendom. Indeed, that's a term that's been used throughout history. Uh, Kierkegaard, for example, distinguished between what he saw as a, as a sort of liberating Christianity on the one hand and the dead hand of institutional religion that he labelled Christendom on the other hand. When we use the term, what we mean by it is that period, which is really 1,700 years, in particularly in European history, where um, some of the major churches have done a kind of deal with governing authority. And effectively, what they've done is to say, look, we will give you our uh, religious blessing on the one hand, if you give us particular positions of privilege and protection on the other hand. And that era for a number of years has been coming to an end. Now, Ecclesia's perspective is that it's good that that's coming to an end, because um, our understanding of, of the core of the Christian message is about liberation, not about an imperial dominating kind of religion. Indeed, we do need to remind ourselves from time to time that Jesus was actually executed by a toxic combination of the wrong kind of religion and the wrong kind of politics. So that's very important. But there's a, a, a new possibility emerging out of that. But what we're seeing is really quite a strong backlash 
um, from uh, ideologues against, um, in a sense, that the removal of privilege and prestige and that kind of imperial top-down church and top-down religion. So people are feeling threatened, and one of the responses of that is is those who are using an, a, 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 a narrative of persecution within the UK to describe what is in fact, the loss of their ability to tell other people within the churches and outside the churches what they should do and to try and enforce that by law. So would you say then, would you diagnose this problem as a bit of a, a Christian identity crisis, uh, perhaps sim uh, perhaps similar to, uh, to the crisis in masculinity caused by moves towards gender equality? Yeah, I, I, I think that's absolutely case. Uh, the, the case that when uh, you, you find movements of change and of liberation within society, um, there is an identity crisis and some people feel threatened. I, I certainly don't think the majority of, of people who identify as, as, as active Christians in the UK actually buy into this persecution narrative. I think it's a very small number of people who are trying to promote it, but some people are rather prey to it because they're confused and baffled by the fact that they, they, they used to be able to count count on, you know, a, a certain kind of recognition, a certain kind of social status coming out of their, their Christianity, and that's no longer the case. And what we're doing is saying, actually, you know, that kind of privilege really didn't have anything to do with the core of, of, of what the, the Christian gospel is about, if you look at it hard. And it's something we need to move away from. And actually, there are lots of new opportunities for finding bridges rather than walls between ourselves and other people, finding common cause. Also, you know, where there are disagreements on the basis of religion or anything else, finding different and better ways of disagreeing rather than trying to enforce your, your views. But I mean, the, the kind of issues that are really important around this are, for example, equality issues and Ecclesia has argued for long, a long time that it's entirely wrong for example that the Church of England if I might talk about a church across the border from where I live that the Church of England has exemptions to equalities legislation that it is a, a church established under the crown we, we think that's wrong as, as well. We think that it's wrong that there are in the second unelected chamber of Westminster um, people from uh, one who leaders from one religion of one country who actually take part in the, the, the legislative process. Everyone who is in Parliament, however they get there by election or nomination, should do so on the same basis. You know, if bishops want to to uh, to put themselves forward for um, you know a second chamber, that's absolutely fine. But it should be on the same basis as everybody else, not because they're bishops of one church, of one religion, of one country, and so on. So those kind of things we would challenge from a Christian point of view and enable, hopefully enable people to see that there's a positive case for that change and it actually opens up a new kind of path for a, a different kind of Christianity in the 21st century, which interestingly enough will perhaps have a little more in common with, with some of the earlier strands in Christianity before it became an imperial religion. Might an effort to make uh, more Christians aware of the tradition of, you know, secular secularist thought within uh, Christianity, and more aware of the experiences of, uh, you know, because cr Christians in this country are becoming a minority religion, has become a majority non-religious yeah. country. Yes. So perhaps you know, more uh, more knowledge of what it's like to uh, to be a Christian community in a say a majority Muslim or majority Hindu country. Yeah, well, that's a really interesting point, actually, because, of course, Christians in other parts of the world have long experience of being minority communities. I mean, Christians in the Middle East, let, let's remember that Christianity in in the Middle East is has a longer tradition than Islam, for example. It's the, the cradle of Christianity. And in most countries in the Middle East, Christians are minorities. So they've had to negotiate their position in society from a di very different kind of perspective. And actually, over the years, that's often been a very positive experience. At the moment, of course, for many, it's an extremely negative experience for reasons that I hope we're going to go on and discuss in terms of worldwide persecution of people on the basis of, of religion or belief, um, which, as you said, does affect Christians particularly badly, though I don't think we should be trying to, uh, in a sense, out-compete each other as yes, different of kinds course. of communities. But, but mean, nevertheless, it's important to recognise that. So, yes, that's one thing, beginning to rethink your position, your place and your opportunities. I think it's about two things. I think it's about looking for the sources of 
pluralism and bridge building within your own community and tradition. And I would want to say, as a Christian, that Christianity is an internal argument. There are strands historically within Christianity, within the life of the church, within the Christian scriptures and so on, which are monarchical and overbearing and somewhat authoritarian, but there are also strongly liberating traditions which are about freedom and autonomy and justice for the poor and peacemaking and other kinds of things. And that argument has gone on throughout Christian history and it's going on at the moment. And I'm part of that argument and I would want to advocate a Christian perspective which is wants to see a uh, a, a plural society, a level playing field, the freedom of ourselves uh, tied into the necessary freedom of other people who are different to ourselves and so on. So there's kind of pragmatic argument um, uh, for, for, for secularism. There's also, I think, an argument from within each of our traditions for a secular polity, which is about a level playing field. And I mean, last comment to make on that, in, in his book, The Jesus Candidate, Paul Lusk makes the point that Christians within Europe have actually contributed to the development of a secular polity in a positive way. Again, I would want to be very careful and not sort of, you know, do the imperial thing of claiming that somehow secularism is the product of Christians and so we take credit for it and, and so on and so on. It's something that's developed from a number of different sources, as has humanism, but it does seem to me if we can recover a sense of that, um, that there is a shared thing that we're trying to do here, which is to create freedom and opportunity for all, then we can find a pragmatic way forward, as well as finding those resources deep within our own traditions which argue in favour of that. Mm. I mean, I would uh, sort of conceptualise it as perhaps um, something I've been thinking about recently. Of secularism is like a a language. That if if two people are speaking different moral languages, one is speaking the moral language of Christianity, and one is the moral language of atheism. Yeah. And secularism is sort of a, la a language that's neither of their native tongues, but they can they both can share, but then would both be speaking it with their own accent. Yes. So, I, I really like that. I think that's important. I think we can all contribute something to it. It is, it is a common space, a common language, and a common opportunity that we are trying to create. And I think that's that's really, really important. I mean, I would say also uh, that, that we need to recognise that secularism um, as a way of thinking and as a path for action has taken different forms. And um, I'm, I'm at the kind of um, liberal plural end of, of it, if you like. I mean, some people have interpreted secularism as a, a, an attempt to exclude religion from public life. And I think that's much less helpful and much less healthy. I think the way in which secularism developed in France is not so much to, to, to my taste for a number of reasons, though I understand why it's happened in the way that it has. I think we need a, a more plural path. So on the one hand, what I would say is um, we need a, a separation of religion and state and, and government. And I would argue that we need that on, in my case, Christian grounds as well as on secular grounds. But, you know, there's plenty of space for people of different religious convictions and no religious conviction in civil society and public life. They, they shouldn't claim uh, privilege uh, in the way that they engage. They should seek to engage in a, in a conversational way to try and persuade one another about public goods. And so I think that's, that's really quite possible. And I, I mean, I noticed that when a lot of my uh, atheist and humanist friends, uh, uh, you know, object to religion being involved in politics, um, what they tend to mean by that, I think quite rightly, is, is manipulative domineering attempts by religious organisations to privilege themselves at the expense of others. I don't know that many atheists who complain about, let's say, um, Desmond Tutu or Martin Luther King. And there's a good reason for that, which is that they uh, their, their involvement in politics is very strong. And their argument is that their politics is resourced from the liberating strands in Christianity. But they're not not trying to privilege themselves, they're trying to campaign for human freedom, justice and peace for everybody and therefore they're very willing to work with other people and so on. That seems to me to model the positive engagement of religion in public life uh, as distinct from that dominating uh, attempt or the confusion of religion with state and government. Uh, so I, I, you know, I, I want a level playing field for us all. I want a space where we feel we really can bring 
the depths of our own traditions and thinking to, to public debate, but uh, in a way that opens up possibilities rather than contributes to a narrative of domination. Mm. I'm often very confused by these opinion polls that we you ask people a question of like, do you think religion should influence politics and you tend to get sort of these vast majorities up in the 80s 90s percent of people saying no but yeah. I think that's a product of the question is is too narrow as you say someone someone who is uh, influenced by their faith to support equality yeah, versus someone who's influenced by their faith to support discrimination is there is that that's the difference. It's not yes. the where the influence comes from. I, I I think that's absolutely right. And I mean, when I'm asked that question, well, well, you know, do you think we should separate religion and politics? I say uh, two things really. I say, well, first of all, um, I'm not in favour of the wrong kind of religion being involved in promoting the wrong kind of politics. By which I mean the kind of politics and the kind of religion which which denies human dignity, which denies human rights, which which takes civil liberties away from people, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I want to argue against that, and I think we should. But where people are using uh, their religious tradition and their motivation to open up space and possibility for other people, that's a, a really quite different thing. So I, th I think there are two kinds of things that we're talking about when, when we talk about religion and politics in, in those terms. But the other thing is, I mean, sometimes people will say, and it's commonly said in a sort of liberal democratic society, well, religion is a purely private thing and it needs to be kept to the private sphere. Well, first of all, you know, I would have to say personally that, that as a Christian, my Christianity impels me to get involved with issues of, of peace and justice. So I don't see it as a purely private thing. Um, I, I see it as, as a matter of public engagement. But the second thing is that when people gather together for religious or any other purposes, they create institutions, they have buildings, they pay taxes, they employ people. There's no way in which it can be a purely private enterprise. That's just not possible. So the issue then becomes what kind of public enterprise enterprise is it you know what how do we pay our taxes how do we treat ourselves and other people with equality and justice and so on and what are the values that actually underpin that and that's what we need a conversation about yes i think that is a, a product when people say that it's obviously a prof, often a product of language not they being very precise um so i mean for, for yeah. example, I, I meet, uh, from my, my role of work in education at the NSS, many, many people who say they don't want any religious education in schools. Yes. But then I've never met anyone I have a conversation with that actually means that. What they mean is there's this idea of, or there's this type of religious education I don't want. And I think that's very similar. Many people would say, I don't want religion involved in politics. And if there's yes. sort of, and if you had like, you know, a yes, no tick box, you know, I think I'd probably tick the yes. I, I agree with that statement tick box. But if I was given, you know, 140 characters to expand on that versus a five, and then a five minute conversation to expand on that, that position is, you know, <laughs> even though you or I might, tick, you might tick the no, I might tick the yes. Actually in the longer conversation, our position is much more aligned. Yeah, oh, I mean, well, being being a natural member of the awkward squad, I would just cross the box out and write something else underneath it. But <laughs> but I, I think it is important that we, we, we really need to create better understanding and a better conversation. And since you've come on to the matter of education, uh, again, Ecclesia was part of setting up the Accord Coalition, which campaigns against religious discrimination in education and wants to see the reform of schools that are religious foundation schools away from uh, uh, excluding people on the basis of religion uh, or giving privilege to, to certain kinds of, of perspectives and so on. So again, there's a large measure of agreement between us as, as Christians and um, yeah, humanists and atheists in that kind of area. But as far as religious education is concerned, again, I would want to talk about education about religion or belief and um, values and life stances and so on to broaden it out. And it seems to me absolutely essential in the kind of world we have at the moment, that kids grow up learning about the different convictions that, that people hold and ways of handling all of that stuff. But it's not about um, propaganda or trying to inculcate people into one way rather than another way. It's about 
you know, learning how to be citizens that, amongst other things, deal with issues of religion, belief, along with politics, economics, environment, and so on. So I think when people uh, want to say, you know, they want to keep religious uh, teaching out of schools, what they mean is they want to keep um, propaganda and attempts to indoctrinate people into one way out of schools. And of course, I entirely agree with that. Um, not incidentally that I think anyone should be doing indoctrination and propaganda, but it is the role, for example, of Christian communities, you know, to, to, to bring up people within those communities to give them an understanding of what that community stands for. And of course, then also to give people the choice to, to stay in that community or leave that community. That seems to me to be really important. But it's the, 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 the job of the church is to teach Christianity. It isn't the job of a public publicly funded school to try and make people Christians or indeed atheists or Muslims or Jews or Sikhs or Hindus or anything else from that point of view. Uh, the, the job of the public school is to enable us to engage together. And I think, of course, that happens when you have the kind of schools which can be mixed, where people meet not just in, in textbooks or in propositions, but they actually meet people in the playground, down their street, etc. And I think the problem with faith schooling at the moment is that it's actually dividing people on, on grounds of religion. And I, as a Christian, think that's wrong. Mm. And, I, and I think, uh, without getting too distracted, like that, that does go then back to the question of the crisis of identity. Yes. And the, the, I think yes. the fear among some religious things, the groups that that internal community uh, faith formation aspect isn't sustainable in the long run that that uh, that if we don't have the faith formation taking place in schools that it's not going to be able to take place and some christians will then say well what we need to do in response to this is we need to find a new way to engage the public through perhaps increased charitable work that's sort of reaching out to people and some christians would say well we need to double down on you know we the faith formation can't take place in churches so take place in schools well, yes. I mean, my response to that would be, well, first of all, you know, if, if as Christian communities, you can't even have your own, you know, forms of education, which show that, that Christianity is a, a viable uh, belief, a viable way of life, etc. Um, that's, that's a council of complete despair, and you should perhaps pack up and go home. Um, also, you shouldn't be expecting someone who, who isn't Christian to somehow make Christians of us. But I, I do sometimes think that, that the sort of within parts of the Church of England as the established church, for example, there's this kind of idea that the next generation will be produced by, you know, increasing our stake in public schooling, etc. Of course, the actual evidence is that when you try and put religion onto the curriculum as a way of inculcating people into a certain form of belief, be it Christianity or anything else, what you usually do is you inoculate people against it. And indeed, that's what's been happening, I think, really. So, you know, the churches have to take responsibility for their own stuff and stop believing that someone else should do it for them, really. But that's part of the kind of Christendom mindset that, you know, we should be privileged, we should be in control, other people should be serving our interests. That's disappearing. And uh, I think it's spiritually healthy that it's disappearing. Um, and we're, we're likely to see, I think, the continuation of the decline of institutional and formal religion. But I believe that out of that, there's the possibility of the recreation of a much more healthy form of Christian community and, and witness, if you like. And by the term witness, I mean simply living out a good example of what you're about, really, not trying to propagandise other people in, in forced ways. So there's a whole a lot of stuff there which relates to, to what you've called the identity crisis, and I think that's right. But, um, you know, I think now let's also get back to this whole question of what we mean by uh, uh, religious freedom or freedom of religion and belief and what are the threats to it, because this is something I think where Christians and atheists and other people have a very common agenda in seeking to identify what's going wrong and how we challenge it. I mean, give, give, give us your diagnosis and your prescription. Okay. Well, I mean, first of all, what are the threats to freedom of religion and belief uh, to the freedom of believers, whether they're religious or non-religious believers, as I prefer to put it throughout the world. Now, I think 
Ironically, of course, one of the answers to that is that one of the biggest threats to freedom of religion comes from religion. Um, in other words, from uh, dominating and top-down forms of, of religion that really develop a narrative of exclusion and domination and, frankly, hatred as well. And that does happen within uh, pretty well all religious traditions. I think I might exclude, exclude the Quakers from that, for example. I think uh, uh, those of us who are both religious or non-religious can learn an awful lot from the Quakers, both historically and from their practice. But unfortunately, that is a trend within a lot of religion. The second thing I'd say is that the threat comes from people of a totalitarian mindset who kind of believe that only they should really have freedom and everyone else should do what they want. And I'm afraid you find these people, um, you know, you find them amongst religious communities, you find them amongst uh, political, ideological, non-religious communities, political parties and groups as well. So that's the second kind of threat. The third threat at the moment that I think is particularly prominent in different parts of the world is the growth of the far right. And um, often the way in which the far right can co-opt uh, religion, perhaps particularly Christianity, as we're seeing in the United States at the moment, or yeah, we're seeing in the, the likes of someone like Nigel Farage says we should be a Christian nation which keeps immigrants out, etc., etc. He has a very particular ideological picture of what Christianity has. And in terms of white evangelicals in the United States, many of them have almost totally abandoned core aspects of the Christian message and turned it into a hard right-wing ideology. It's become evacuated, really, of spiritual meaning. So it's interesting, I've referred a couple of times to Paul Lust, but the Jesus candidate, um, that came from, I can't remember which of the um, uh, religious right candidates in a previous American election used, first used that term, the Jesus candidate. But the, whoever said it, their, their point was that every election needs a Jesus candidate. And they went then went on to say extraordinarily, of course, this, this Jesus candidate, this Christian candidate, shouldn't do any of the things that Jesus talked about, shouldn't love our enemies, shouldn't forgive people, shouldn't stand up for the poor and so on. That's all entirely unrealistic. Um, what we must do, essentially, is put ourselves in control. So what it's done is to turn Christianity into an ideology which says we are the representatives of God and we will rule and dominate other, other people. Now, I think that's, I'm tempted to use the word blasphemous. For certain reasons, I don't tend to use that word very much, which we'll come on to in a minute. Um, I, I would say it's, a, it's an obscenity, really. Um, and there's a massive crisis of identity within Christianity in the United States as a result. But undoubtedly, a certain kind of Christianity has been co-opted for a certain kind of... Uh, political agenda, which uh, seeks to to go against uh, equality for all people, human rights. It's even in favour of torture and other kinds of things. And from my point of view, it's something I, as a Christian, because this is justified in terms of Christian language, scripture and so on, have a particular responsibility to be engaged in combating. And certainly that is one of the, the things that Ecclesia is seeking to do. So that kind of co-option of religion, and then I think that the last kind of threat to, to freedom of religion and belief comes from, from what I would call exceptionalism. The temptation of all communities to say, we above all people are treated badly, and so, you know, we, we will pursue our own interests interests uh, without really paying attention to other people. And it seems to me that actually freedom of believers, whether religious or non-religious, is indivisible. If we are not campaigning for the other, but only campaigning for ourselves, we're not really campaigning for freedom. We're campaigning for privilege. And so it's extremely important that we find ways of standing together across our other differences for the indivisibility of freedom of thought and freedom of action in this kind of context. Mm. I mean, one of the issues you raise there is a phenomenon which I would refer to as uh, either Christian nationalism or Christian supremacy, yes. and I don't, I, I don't want to get into this trap of. I think many religious people do it of when someone's manifestation of religion you don't like, you say, "Oh, they're not a real Christian, right. or they're not a real Muslim, yeah. or they're not an atheist." But there does seem to be these people, and I think there's a significant number of them, uh, even within the various atheist communities, that view uh, whether or not they're personally religious, uh, view privile privileging Christianity as uh, central to a certain form of Western civilization 
and I think we can all, when people say Western civilization, we know what that's code for. So yes. uh, we we see this among certain lead, uh, lead, leading figures within the English Defence League and within Britain First who don't seem to be personally religious or even have, have said stuff that suggests they don't believe in God, but are very much invested in defending the idea of a Christian country. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, Donald Trump, uh, Donald Trump is, is an atheist by by all accounts, but is also certainly a christian nationalist in terms of his political thinking yeah well i mean I, I, you know i have no idea about what his personal beliefs are apart from very clearly believing in donald trump and his own interests but uh and, and really that's not my concern my concern is the way in which he has uh quite openly courted what you rightly call christian nationalists now again from my point of view i'd say that christian nationalists are a lot to do with nationalism and not much to do with christianity but i i, I think that something you said there is incredibly important i'm not going to sort of say oh these people aren't real christians so you know i can ignore them etc if they use use a Christian language and source themselves in that way, I as a Christian have some responsibility to engage with that and I have some specialist experience in using and understanding what that language is about and so I, I have a responsibility to try and combat that. They will of course deny that I'm a Christian but I have no need to do that. I'm interested in what their ideas are, how they're using them and how they're harming people. So that's one side of an equation but I've also been in a, in a situation which I think at least one member of, of the National Secular Society, I'm, I'm sure not necessarily representative in this, uh, accused me once of, of being a cover for such people. You know, the very fact that I'm a Christian, and I think I was designated as a liberal Christian, means that I'm providing cover for all kinds of terrible fundamentalists and so on, which uh, I, I think is also wrong. I mean, simply from the point of view that if you look at, I don't know, someone like Franklin Graham in the United States, people like me are far worse than atheists or all kinds of other people that he regards as terrible because he knows that You're someone apostate. like yes well that's right and and because he knows that when he treat, tries to use the bible to justify all kinds of awful things um i am amongst other things a theologian and understand principles of legitimate and illegitimate interpretation and use of texts and will challenge all of that and so there's nothing more than that totalitarians hate than people who have the same kind of labels from them but actually can call them out for what they are doing and again therefore for me it is extremely important to do that but also to make common cause with um, atheist and humanist friends and muslim friends and jews and sikhs and hindus and others who are trying to do the same things within their own communities and across those kind of boundaries those are the the the, the common bonds that we actually need uh, to, to develop, because amongst other things, that proves that one of the central narratives of Christian nationalism is wrong, and part of that narrative is that somehow, you know, people who are different to you are, are a threat and must be excluded. No, actually, in our diversity lies our strength, if we can find better ways of cooperating and better ways of conversing together. Simon, uh, it seems like every every question sort of opens up a whole new avenues <laughs> and things uh, f things for us to talk about. You know, I perhaps perhaps we just need to we need to sit down with like uh, some coffee, some tea and biscuits, and chat all these things through much more at our leisure. But uh, you've been very generous with your time, so I think we're going to draw it to a close there. Uh, Simon, thank you very much for your time. Uh, before you go, we always like to ask our guests. Are there any recommendations for books or films that you think do a good job of exploring uh, freedom of religion and belief? Um, yeah, well, I'll, I'll mention a couple of books, and I'll, I won't mention ones that I've been involved in myself, um, very self-effacingly here. Um, it's not a strict I, rule. <laughs> but well, in this case, I think that there are a couple of others that I, I've already mentioned. The Jesus Candidate, um, Political Religion in a Secular Age by Paul Lusk, and that's uh, an Ecclesia book. Uh, you can find it uh, on Amazon and you can find it on a number of other sites that, that don't involve colluding with Amazon's non-payment of taxes, as you choose. Um, another couple of books that I'd, I'd mention, I'd mention Faith and Politics After Christendom, um, which is by Jonathan Bartley. Jonathan, of course, 
doesn't have anything to do with Ecclesia anymore. He, he was the founder of it and we worked together for a number of years. He's now working as co-leader of the Green Party of, of England and Wales. So uh, that book was written a, a number of years ago, back in 2006. But it's a, it's a fabulous exploration of the sort of scene of Christianity in the UK, including the sort of right-wing radicalisation that's been happening in some Christian circles and those issues of freedom and belief that come up as a result of that. So I think that's quite insightful. It also illustrates our understanding of what Christendom means and why we need to be moving away from that from a Christian point of view as well as from the point of view of a secularist. And then the last book I would mention isn't directly on this subject, but I have touched on Quakers in the midst of all of this. And my colleague Jill Seger, who's an associate director of Ecclesia, has just published a book called Words Out of Silence, which is a collection of poetry and prose. And um, uh, in, in writing something about this, I said I think it will appeal to people of both religious and non-religious persuasion and begin to open up the kind of conversations which enable us to think and act together much more collegially and show also how someone from a particular spiritual path can, you know, have deep understanding and connection with, with people who are quite different to them as well. And I think that's as important as the campaigning action for civil rights uh, against the erosion of equalities on religious or other grounds and so on that we must be engaged in together. Okay, well, we'll have links to those in the show notes and as well to our review of The Jesus Candidate. Oh, uh, excellent. Good. <laughs> so, thank you very much and I hope we speak again soon. Well, that was the penultimate episode of this series, so thanks for joining us. Episode 10, my interview with Pragna Patel, should be out next week, and at that point I'll have some closing thoughts on the whole series. This won't be the last podcast on the National Secular Society. We have plans for future interviews, in-depth coverage of specific issues, and other news and commentary. So please keep subscribed, please keep sharing with your friends, and leaving us five-star reviews everywhere you can. This will be my final or maybe penultimate chance to plug our major upcoming conference, Secularism 2019. That's on Saturday, 18th of May at the Tower Hotel in central London. When this episode comes out, there'll be about a week left to book tickets, but they are running out fast. Uh, Tickets are just £50 uh, with 50% and 80% discounts available for NSS members and students. So pretty incredible value. They include the full day conference with our internationally esteemed lineup of speakers, lunch, refreshments, and our Secrets of the Year awards drinks reception overlooking Tower Bridge. You can visit secularism.org.uk forward slash 2019 for details on all our speakers and to buy tickets. This podcast is made possible by the National Secular Society, a non-profit organisation which works for the separation of religion and state and equal respect for everyone's human rights so that no one is either advantaged or disadvantaged on account of their beliefs. Please make a stand for freedom, fairness and human rights by adding your voice to the call for a secular democracy at secularism.org.uk. I've been Alice Lichten, thank you again for joining us. Until next time, goodbye.